Okay, so um, we're going to be looking at, at a few spaceships. We're going, to, we're going to be looking at a number of different things here, both, um, well, running our language, we'll be running our language together with other languages, and also looking at Observer. I don't know how many people have looked at Observer. Some have. So one of the things that the Allang system is very good at is introspection. And Observer does some of the introspection work. You can do a lot more. It does some of the semantics. So we'll see. So we will start up the system. So um, what I run, I'm not going to show any more on this shell, but what I'm running in this shell is actually a, a separate node. I'm going to run Observer for that node. So we run an Observer in one Allang node, looking at the node doing all the ship stuff. So we can start up Observer here. I'm, I'm not going to make this any bigger because all I'm all, all I'm writing now is Observer colon start. That's it. I'm not going to do anything more in this shell. So directly. So now I've popped up Observer and here is. It's looking at itself, it's not doing anything. So, for example, we have load charts. If you look at the schedulers, you can see there's no load on. But now, if we go back to our uh, this one here, I, I've now started up the ship, the Allen system. I'm now, now going to run spaceship. So, we will try and do start. It starts the system. I'm going to say I'm going to have a space, a universe of 400 by 400, and I'll run 2,000 ships. Now we start up the universe there, and um, yeah, there's nothing in it yet. But now, if I do a start run, I'm now going to start the run, and the 75 here is the tick time for each ship. So th this is basically how often the ship is going to update the notes every 75 milliseconds. So now we start up, now suddenly all these ships pop up. Do you see them? Yes. So now we're running 2,000 spaceships in our universe. And these spaceships are very naive if you look at them. They go in a straight line until they hit the edge of the universe and they bounce out. Follow one down the edge and it bounces. Now, um, this system is written in Allen, of course. Um, it uses the SDL graphics, graphics for doing this. It's a very simple SDL interface. I didn't write it. And the logic is written in Lua. So each of these so I have an implementation of Lua in our language, and each of these ships run its own, runs its own little Lua machine to implement the logic. That's wrong. So now I can go back and start looking at that observer here, and now I'll say, okay, I'm looking at observer, I now want to look at the other node so I can see which node, and I want to look at the sim, which is the simulator node. So now we'll see an observer, it's getting all its information from the simulator node. Now we suddenly see that the, that the schedule is doing quite a lot of work here. Uh, we see that they are load balanced, for example, so the load, the load balance is quite easy. Uh, we can see the memory usage on the left. I can't, unfortunately, make that bigger. But we can see here, for example, we can see the memory usage. And most systems are very simple. We can even see the IO as well. Um, we can look at how the memory allocation works. I cannot explain this. I mean, literally, I cannot explain this. I mean, there, there are a few people. So, so what I can do now is, of course, uh, this code is written in um, Lua. I can reload it. I can change the code while it's running it. So what I can do for this certain number of ships is say now they should run some other type of code. So we can change the logic. And what we can do here is I can do set ships. So we can. 
can set, say, the first 700, I can make them something called a run ship. Now what a run ship does, so the original one was a default ship, and what a run ship does is it, it still goes, well, it sort of goes in a straight line, but when it starts getting around near the edge of the universe, it changes its logic, it goes around, around the edge of the universe. And if we start these, you'll see some of them are starting to go free. Can you see that? I don't think I can make much bigger of them. But there are some green ships. If you look at those, they do behave differently. So I've reprogrammed the green ship. And if we look, start looking at the observer here, we saw there was a spike in our blow ship node, and now we're seeing actually a warning. Oops. You can see those memory increases. Um, so yeah, this is running. And, I, and again, here is the thing is, I've, these are each ship is a separate ally process. So if we go back and look here, for example, we can see in the system we are running 2,049 processes. So 2,000 of those there are the actual spaceships. The other 49 processes are something else. So there's there's a, there are a few system processes. Um, well, there's a basic ally system process. It's about 48 different stuff. I'm not rushing through processes. And um, the graphics are just implemented very simply. So when a ship changes position, it just goes and writes in the table saying, I'm now here. Just saying where it is. And then the graphics package will just run through this and say, every 20 milliseconds, it scans through this table and wants to print out all the ships. So that's what this is. I can make it run slower and faster. Again, just simple. We can do a lot more things here. Um, we can make some ships, we can make them timid ships. They're, they're frightened. They're, they're very timid. So when they go forward, we can set these safe to zero. We can set safe to 700, 701 to 900. We'll make these timid ships. And you'll find they have another color, they go slightly yellowish. Um, what a timid ship does, it keeps going in a straight line. If there's a ship just in front of it, it flips and goes back the other way. I can show you the Lua code after. It's very simple. They also bounce and bounce off the other way. Now this is changing. And if we went back and looked at our um, server here, our load charts, we see there's another spike on our load of those ships. This is not in increase load very much. Um, of course, this is a game. What you have to be able to do in a game is kill things. What's not a game? So we can make attack ships. Now attack ships, they also go in a straight line, but when they when they get a ship immediately in front of it, they kill it. So we can put attack ships here and we'll just we'll just make a hundred of these. Just set them to nine different things. I don't want to make too many because otherwise they die too fast. So we'll make and now they turn orangey red. Unfortunately, I don't have a sound interface, so every time a ship dies, it goes boom. We, we have sound in my system. We have sound. We also can see, we can see the right zap. That means when a ship is shooting another ship. And you see little yellow squares here? They're explosions. I'm not a graphics person. So we see the ships dying. And if we go back and look at our observer here, we can see, well, the loads go down, of course. The ships are dying. And if I look at the system here, we'll see the number of processes have gone down. We've almost killed a thousand ships already. We've killed 800 ships today. They're going pretty fast. Um, I can do a lot more fun things with the Allen system. So if we go back to the load charts there, if I start writing, um, let me show you something. You might see how this works. So I can go here. So we have this concept uh, of schedulers. Basically, there's one scheduler per core, so if I can change it, I can change this. So I can say how many I want to run. So we can do our lane control on system flag. So I'm going to change these. And the flag I want to change is schedulers online. So I want to say, and the load's dropping. I don't want to run. I don't. I don't want to run eight schedulers anymore. So I can now run four schedulers. And if I spelled everything correctly, yep. 
So we see four schedules have now shut down, and all the, all the work's been moved over to the other two schedules. So we saw some load increase here, and we saw a decrease here. So I'm changing, I'm changing this while this is going on. I haven't deleted the schedules, I've just said move all the work off four schedules onto the other schedule. This is basically what the system is doing. Um, we still see, even though the process the ships are dying, we're still seeing it keep, keeping everything pretty well low balanced. Beam makes quite a lot of effort to keep low balance. We also see down here we saw some strange things with schedules with rockets. Um, what it tries to do occasionally when the load gets down too far, it tries to say, well, I don't actually need to run all these schedules. Maybe I can stop the schedules on my own. And move this out of the way. And that's what it's doing. That was what it was doing. Um, if we go back to this here, we'll see we don't have any issues. Yeah, this just these are simple schedules. And, um, yeah. Um, I want to stop this and show one, start up again, show one other thing. And then it's someone else's turn. So, yeah. For those who are interested, I can show you the, show you the Lua code after this. Down this disturbance. So yeah, now we'll start this up again. If I set this at hundred, it should just go slower. Okay, so um, what was happening before w with the timid ships and the attack ships, um, they were basically, well, especially the attack ship, what was happening was that would go out and look at the universe and look in the universe and see if there are any ships that are running. And then it would send them a zap signal, a zap message, which would kill the ship. And that would hit the ship, and the ship would then die, explode, and die, and then disappear. So it was just an asynchronous sending an asynchronous. Do other things as well. There are other uh, other versions of doing stuff uh, which also communicate with the ship. However, we can try another one here. What would be nice is if we can make the ships run in flocks. So these are all running independently. Maybe we can get them cooperating with each other and running in flocks. So we can try that. We can try that. Just an example of what we said. There is a there is a flock ship. Set a thousand of these, and they all turn orange. Green. Um, after a while, we notice things here. We can see things happening in our system. Some of the ships are stopping, and why are they stopping? Well, we can stop a few more. If we want to we can stop a few more here. We can say, well, now. They're doing synchronous communication. That is the problem. So each ship, when it finds a ship in front, it sends it a message that says, tell me your position in your fleet. And then it sits and waits for a reply. Now we have ships sending synchronous messages to each other. And of course, when they start talking with each other, they'll, 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 they'll be talking. They'll be sending messages to another ship, asking its speed, and someone else asking it to tell them to start talking. So this is a very simple example of the danger of doing um, synchronous message passing to remote procedure calls and computing. It is so extremely simple um, to get people to operate. How could we go around it? We could start putting in timeouts and things like this instead. 
the easiest way is to not to do that. So instead of asking your ship what these walls mean, you tell them to send a message to the ship saying, send me a send me this thing, and I will not send it. It is that simple. And we can see, if you look here on the load, you can see the load is dropping. system will eventually go online, eventually get onto GitHub at least, but it's early enough. Um, what I'm doing now with, so now we're running, the, the logic is implemented in, in Lua. That was one of the purposes of doing this. I'm now rewriting, of course, the logic in other languages as well, running on the Alex system as well. Um, we either in, in our language we're in Sierra or something, so we're writing I had a Lua implementation, I wanted to test it. Well, uh, I was giving a talk on it and I wanted a demo for it. And two things, both both demoing the Lua, of course, and also demoing this as a way, uh, another way of writing um, gaming code. Classic gaming code, you have one central loop that runs through all the objects. It's got a bit better now, but still, it's still very, not very much a parallel, parallelism in the system. So this was just showing an alternative way of writing things has, has its own little loop and that's what they're doing with this and it's communicating with others so there's no central um, there's no central uh, loop in the system and it's just uh, having a little is just not enough but as I've said I, I'm, I have a ship behavior almost done now which is you can plug, you can plug our lang and or Elixir into the system and mix these things in and actually plug it in the same way which will also mean Anyone else? Quick. Anyone else? Ah, great, great, great question. How much can you do in one line? Quite a lot. <laughs> okay, great. I'll just kill myself. Yeah. <laughs> ah, no sense of humor. That's fantastic. So the question was, oh, oh, sorry, I should introduce myself. Um, my name is Roger Hui. I work for Dialogue Limited. And I would like to thank Arash, I think, for inviting me to give a demo of the three of this is what I can do. So, Robert asked, how much can you do in one line? So this is a one line. Yes. Can you see it? It's clean. Yeah. It's, um, It's an, uh, what we call a deployment operator, namely a uh, higher order function. Take the function of the function left operator. Here indicated by uh, alpha alpha. That's the operand. So depending on the data, you can give it different function operand to sort it. So for example, the sort number, you can give a very simple function. So 
court, HSC, was disclosed as a matrix, he was given 15 months of incarceration. So to, ex to further explain it, Omega is the array argument, is the uh, array that you want to sort. And so uh, if it has, the, it has uh, one item or less, then you just give Sorting table item is the item that has the, the argument itself is the sort of one. Item again is the matrix itself. Otherwise, you go into this thing. And what it does is it selects a random item from the argument, from the thing you're trying to sort. Select what's more trivial. So it's a good pair against the entire group. And the uh, offering function is, is spec is required to give a negative or zero or one, depending on whether the comparison is sort of random or not. Okay, and that's the selecting S. And so in this part, it's selecting where S is. It's going to recursively sort that. And then in the middle part, you're going to select the parts where S is 0, and the other ones where omega is 2 is the pivot. No sorting required because they're all equal. And then you're going to recursively sort the items out where S is negative. show you a different, uh, a slightly different quick sort. You see it's uh, showed on side this time. So what Q1 does is uh, instead of catenating them, it's uh, what we call stranding them. And you'll see Instead of catenation, which is what that comma bar does, I'm just stranding, stranding them on the juxtaposed points. And then what that gives me is the structure of the, the arguments that they so at each level, they're going to be triplets. So overall, there's a triplet. And the first triplet are the items that are less than the pivot. The middle one is, are the items equal to the pivot. And the uh, third triplet, the third of the triplet, Greater than the uh, pivot, and it's recursively applied at each point. So, if 
I do this again, it'll give a different structure to the two is the pivot at the end. Right here, this time the pivot is four. That is it for a quick sort. Uh, if you want to see more, there's there's a paper called let me see. Yeah. The history of APR and critical function which I promised to do last when I was here last year. It's now done. And I'll give you the This is not specifically related, directly related to that project, but this is a very small portion of what uh, we thought we would create eventually, which is uh, in a production system, uh, there are certain APIs uh, which we want to generate on ad hoc, and uh, you want to run it in a jail environment, uh, and you want to take it off and add it, change it at your will. You don't want to deploy code. Uh, there are many ways of doing it, but this is one small way of doing it, just to also demonstrate what Erlang is capable of in terms of people, uh, a lot of people who are new, and they want to look at uh, how the Erlang can actually compile code on the fly, load it into memory. You can actually slow it, get bring back again into memory, recompile, uh, and do all that magic. Uh, yeah, and you can have as many functions as you want. Like, you, know, you can even tie them together. You can do a lot of introspection. All that power, uh, plus you can also look at the complexity of a function, which is you can find out the number of reductions uh, it took while you execute the function. You can uh, do all sorts of things which I think are useful, uh, and uh, we would want, definitely want to try that uh, first in staging and then go to production. But this is a sneak peek of what uh, that we want to achieve. So this is just a uh, WebSocket interface into uh, using Cowboy into a lang, and uh, there are a couple of uh, commands which I understand. Uh, so these are the functions which which are uh, these functions are defined. If you ask something new, so if you ask questions, then it's so there is no function which is like over NLP defined. So it's Actually, uh, doesn't know about it, so let's why don't we define it? Same question again. So it's actually querying uh, uh, the the Stanford project with Core NLP and getting all the results as a JSON format. It's a simple function, but uh, you're defining on the fly. Even if I shut down the virtual machine and start it up, it's getting from a database. Uh, so you can load it up. It can even be shared across uh, your cluster machine. Likewise, you can uh, I'll just skip a couple of them. Kind of same. If you got the, the context here, 
So what if uh, function which are calling other function? So does it know how to fetch a page? Let's try maybe the website something. No. You can understand. So let's define a function which uh, makes another function call. Let's try that again. So now this time it's supporting that it doesn't understand what is make HTTP get call. Uh, just ask me if I'm running too fast. But I, I, at the end of it, I'll show you uh, all these screen shots which Now it understands the function. Let's run the information back again. It's it's just putting HTML within it. Uh, so kind of you can you can do it as many number of time. You can call as many uh, functions as you want. Basically, it, it, it's like a concept of defining function on the fly, and you can actually delete the function. You can do whatever because this is all powered by a line, so uh, there's hardly anything which I had to do regarding this. Uh, the biggest advantage of this approach would be to run certain uh, functions which we uh, which we need on a daily basis. We have a lot of data stores, and we want to query uh, uh, number of them in unique, unique ways for either debugging, recon, or whatever it is. We don't want to pollute the uh, uh, Platform uh, with those compiled in. So, you, if you want to define on the fly, on production, in a safe manner, then this kind of provides us uh, with that kind of workflow. So, that should be one. Yeah, it, it was actually very fast, but it just run through what was captured. So, uh, it is in the reverse. So, you, uh, so it's basically because of uh, real is able to identify uh, and giving all the constructs where. You know uh, what is unknown and what are known, so it is able to prompt what it doesn't understand, and if you define it, uh, it'll start making sense. Uh, so, so that's pretty much. Okay. Yes. So these are compiled. Uh, uh, in the, so they are loaded in the memory and they're compiled in memory. So you get an, uh, the functions are uh, which are anonymous functions. It's eventually stored in a data store, like key value source. So the, uh, the good that the internet is holding up. So it's actually going over the internet, saving it, and so you can potentially have another application which is also uh, getting all the learning. So technically, if I were running in production, then uh, one of my uh, colleagues would have called that function and got it. So the learnings are basically shared. You can. You, so the application, if, if you want certain function to be run in an application, you have to define in a central store or cluster of machines. So you can get that from any of those uh, the applications, which is kind of shared. Because these are not these functions. This is this is not the, the logic is not to be fast. The logic is supposed to be something ad hoc and something to do with uh, uh, a very. Uh, uh, so we get all the we, uh, we get a lot of requirements all the time, but we don't want to in, uh, implement them in production because. They're just not right. So we need a safe environment. And with Erlang, we can actually. So if I were to show you the screen, the debug screen, you can look at the functions that are being invoked. So uh, I don't know if you can see this. So if you can. You can see a local function call. If I were to uh, highlight that, is that clear enough? So it's uh, Erlang is giving a very nice uh, uh, functionality of uh, looking at which function calls are being invoked and checking it at runtime whether they exist or not. And uh, there is a custom code which is written to intercept that. And then you can either uh, allow those functions to be executed 
or you can actually preempt and say no, you have taken too much of time and you are not allowed or authorized to call such channels. And with distribution, you can actually uh, do many more things. Then the size of because if you can run one function, you can do anything. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Sunny Mahesh, and I want to give a quick talk on repeatable builds in Erlang. The idea kind of uh, came today when I was uh, listening to today's uh, topic, where a few things were mentioned uh, about uh, rebar three being better than rebar two in the sense that you can get some repeatable builds, and that reminded me of a problem that I was solving very recently, less than a week ago. So the title of my talk is uh, "Repeatable Builds in Erlang Land for the Paranoid." Actually, no, it is "Repeatable Builds for the Really Paranoid." Are not really, it's repeatable builds for the really, really fast. So we have a problem in the Erlang that when we build a release, we have no guarantees that when we repeat it, we get the same exact thing again. Mostly because we have a few problems. Uh, before I go into that, I'll speak about myself. I am uh, working as a developer at Appen. I have, I'm also a system administrator, uh, one and all. Mostly these days, I'm working on Erlang, building my own K gateway on Erlang for fun, and then back to the problem space. It's very simple. Generate a release given some Erlang code base, and give some guarantee that you will be getting the exact same release at any point of time in future when you repeat it. And by the exact same release, I mean functionally identical. The problem is this. Like a very simple problem. People coming from other languages might be laughing at this. No, why is this difficult? But how many of you have actually deployed a language? Okay. And uh, uh, what were the build tools that you were using? Not the release tools, the build tools that you were using to build your project before releasing. Previously, there were uh, ELC, Emacs files. Then there was Erlang MK. Then Rebar 2, Rebar 3. These days, Mix. Mix can also compile Erlang project. We have a lot of tools at our disposal, barring some other esoteric or uh, rarely used tools. I'm going to say that every one of them has an issue, and mostly it's uh, because of a few things. Erlang has a very serious dependency problem. We still have uh, use dependencies as source dependencies, and source dependencies keep referring to source dependencies, and we refer to branches. Now imagine my surprise when just a couple of weeks ago I had to deploy a project. One of my dependencies somewhere had an update that I had not paid attention to in the last few months, and everything broke. Things were working just fine, and they broke exactly when I was demoing in front of a client, and I got really frustrated and set out to solve this. So I'll be referring to some. Uh, are these visible? So let's look at how Erlang MK fetches uh, and. Builds its dependencies. It says that it will first go to the first dependency, and recursively it will try to build it. By if it's a if it has a make file, it calls the make file. The make file might be calling rebar two or three, or else it uh, it might uh, Erlang MK typically patches it. And if it's an Erlang MK project, it gets another depth folder under it, and the depths get pulled there and compiled. But this is similar to how Node.js works. We have Node modules where each module has its own Node modules and so on. But we have a very big difference between these two. You can have the same module uh, with different versions in, uh, loaded into the same Node.js process. It's not the same thing in an Erlang land. You have a global uh, module namespace. Given a module name, you can have only one version of the code, barring hot code upgrade. But I'm not going there. But uh, when uh, building here, you can potentially have a single build folder, a single project folder, where you are having multiple versions of the same. Application being brought in, brought in and built. When you make a release, do you have a guarantee that exactly this is what going to happen? These, uh, this is the version that's going to get used. And why again are we using multiple different versions while building? Then we cannot guarantee that uh, they will be used simultaneously when running. Uh, that's the problem with Erlang, and it's clearly defined in the documentation. Nothing to. Uh, Now rebar two was kind of good. It had this beautiful option rebar prefer depths prefer less. If you build, if you uh, manually get every single dependency, 
try to uh, build it and add it to your system a uh, libs or to the environment variable a uh, libs by setting the path and while using rebar2 to compile if you just set this environment variable it will try to it will not try to get, uh, use the dependencies of itself it can it can use the dependencies from the uh, libs on the system which means that one by one very carefully doing you can have repeatable loops but as we saw in the morning rebar2 is not good it has its problems and it's uh, people are moving quickly to rebar. Unfortunately, rebar3 does not provide any similar thing. Rebar3 wants to manage its dependencies by itself and it does not give us any uh, serious control. And while explaining why rebar3 does what it does, uh, we have a very beautiful explanation here. It considers the, the dependency management uh, uh, to be uh, using versions to be informational. Because semantic, ver semantic versioning is something cool. It's something very recent. It was not there when Erlang was around. Er Erlang is uh, ancient. It's not old. It's positively ancient. Back then, people relied on each other to um, keep their code compatible with each other. But no longer. Everybody develops their own project. Everybody moves fast and breaks things eventually. So sem semantic version is out the window. People use source. Uh, dependencies and if you have a problem with some dependency deep inside you'll have to start forking it and everything that depends on it and so on not a, a viable option and not everybody subscribes to the same version schemes git tagging uh, is not prevalent and even then there is no guarantee that somebody goes uh, does not go back and update their git tags or whatever we have hex these days hex is kind of nice because once you publish a version Hex registry prevents you from publishing to the same version using some different code. You'll have to increment the version or something. But again, uh, people do not pin to specific hex versions. People use uh, semantic version ranges. And there is no guarantee that you get the same thing. If the developer misses some update, So even with hex, we don't we have a problem that has not been solved. So and uh, semantic versioning does not work. Rebar three introduces rebar dot lock. Mix introduces mix dot lock. These are very recent. These are a step in the right direction in the sense that they store some reference that they will try to repeat when building, but using the same tools. If any of your dependencies internally are using Erlang dot or so on kind of works using plugins and uh, bridges, but it's not good. And to add to all of this, I recently had an issue where Beam files compiled using one version of Erlang were not uh, usable uh, by dialyzer that was running on a different version of Erlang. This is an unholy mess. So what will, uh, next to the registry. So we, uh, I'm using something called Nix. To those people who do not uh, or haven't heard of it, it's a fairly recent one. It's a purely functional package management. And what it means is that it allows you to do reproducible builds. It has its own, it mixes also its own language where we define some expressions that define a derivation on, it's a logic on how to build something. The interesting part is you can bring along the entire closure. So I'll skip over to the Here is this project that I have uh, done recently. Yesterday, next, I could not load the exact mix file because of the internet issue. What uh, I am doing here is that I have taken every single dependency, locked it down by its content hash, and used some helpers that were defined within the Nix ecosystem to uh, to wrap up building using Erlang MK, Rebar3, or Mix uh, to ensure that I get the same repeatable things and. Uh, this is particularly interesting because no matter, even if I repeat the same thing 10 years down the line, it is guaranteed that I get the same version. Because I'm locking not just the versions of the dependencies, I'm locking the Erlang compiler. I'll go one step further. I lock the GCC that was used to build the Erlang compiler and the hash of the source code that was uh, used to build the Erlang. I'll go one step further. So it turtles all the way down. So from a very minimal bootstrapping base, 
I have complete guarantee that even a decade down the line, I'll be able to repeat everything by building GCC first, then Erlang first, then Elixir first, then each and every dependency. And I don't care if GitHub is down or hexp.pm is down. If I have these contents cached, because the contents are verified by the content hash, if I have them somewhere, I can just load it, and the system is smart enough to uh, substitute. And in fact, rebar three uh, of this has been patched to uh, disallow any network calls. It's a simple uh, patch uh, made by the Nix ecosystem. If you try using rebar three to build something and you make a HTTP call, the entire build fails, saying that you are violating my policies. It's not airtight because the response of the network is unreliable. So yeah, this is just something that I want to 